attention towards him and not ourselves. Amen. Good morning to you. Let me invite you to stand. Great to see you here this morning. Hope everybody's had a wonderful week. And uh, we're going to just begin celebrating this morning. Uh, victory has been given to us in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The day that he called our name. Uh, called us out of the grave. Amen. What a glorious day that is. Let's, continue. Let's uh, begin worshiping this morning by celebrating that truth.
Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of his faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. There are these two glorious ways that Jesus abolishes the fears that might keep us from a rich relationship with God. He gave us a once for all sacrifice and he gives us never stopping intercession. The sinless Savior died, and he ever lives and pleads for me. Our sinful souls are counted free, and our names are written on his heart. He is our perfect, spotless righteousness, and our lives are hid with him on high. No tongue can bid me thence depart, nor can anything else in all creation separate us from his love. Yes. Amen. Amen. I love that passage of Rachel read from Hebrews. Uh, that's such a such a wonderful uh, truth. We're going to be singing about that. We are instructed to sing a new song before the Lord. And sometimes when we sing an old song, it's so old that it feels new. Uh, this is a great old hymn before the throne of God above. And it's got a chorus that will be new to you in it. A little chorus in it, but the whole song may feel new to you. Uh, but let's worship together. So follow them uh, as well as you can through this. Uh, sing this powerful truth. Uh, just praise God for this. Yeah. 
still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never Bibles turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 is where we're going to be this morning. Let me just say that for everybody who helped uh, make uh, Justin and Jeff, who made last week uh, our celebration of 175 years a great celebration. Thank you for uh, all that you did, putting in Mike and Mark and Meredith and Jacqueline. It was great to reflect on and think about all that God's done here in this place. Uh, through the people of Chapel Hill for the last 175 years. You and I are a part of something that God has been doing for a long time. We stand in the stream of God's goodness. What God is doing is not new with us. What God is doing is not didn't just start with us. We stand on the shoulders of people who have experienced God's grace who came before us. We're looking forward to, if Jesus tarries, for continuing on with the ministry that God has called us to. Let me encourage you, if you are in town next week, to be a part of our service uh, next Sunday. We'll be looking at Psalm 78 uh, and the responsibility that we have to share the glories of God with a generation that is not yet born. It's very interesting. It's very, I, I think it's a great thing. We just celebrated 170 years, 75 years last week. And then next week, what we're going to do is we're going to commission those of you who are serving on the Children's Ministry Director Search Team. We're going to commission you in the morning service. Remember a couple weeks ago we voted to approve people uh, to serve on that committee? 
Well, next Sunday morning, uh, we're going to be focusing on the next generation, and we're going to commission that servant, the, the group that's serving on that committee, and then we will have our first meeting together. God already knows the person that he has uh, for Chapel Hill to lead us in our children's ministries efforts. You can tell a lot about a church by looking at a lot of different things, but the way particularly that, children, that uh, church leads and guides children that says a lot about a church. So let me encourage you to pray uh, even now for those that are serving on the search committee and uh, if you can be a part of what's happening here next week as we commission them. Luke chapter 13, we're going to be looking this morning at the first five verses. Well, for the last 18 days, America has been focused with horror and grief on the city of Surfside, Florida, a city just north of Miami. It was there that the 12 story Champlain Tower collapsed. You've seen it in the news, you've heard all about it. As of Tuesday this week, the death toll was at 32, and there were more than 100 residents who were missing. On Thursday, officials transitioned from a search and rescue effort to a search and recovery effort. Uh, speaking of this change, Ray Jandala, who is of the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue, said just based on the facts, there's zero chance of survival. When the tower fell on June the 24th, 159 people were unaccounted for and the death toll stood at four. By this past Wednesday evening, the death toll had risen to 54 and there were 86 people who were missing. In every way, this is a tragedy. Nothing can be done to change the outcome of all of this. But in some ways, this tragedy is far from us. It's down there in Florida. If you drive from here to Surfside, you're going to drive 1,048 miles. This is a tragedy that is down there. In some ways, this is a tragedy that is separated from us. To my knowledge, none of us has personal connections with what has happened. However, we as human beings and we as Christian people, we know that tragedy exists. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where things go wrong. We live in a world where children die and they shouldn't. We live in a world where accidents happen. We live in a world where buildings collapse. So how do we respond? How do we as Christian people react when buildings fall around us, when people unnecessarily die? Of course, we respond in grief, right? We're human beings. Emotion is a good thing. It comes over us. We we weep, we, we grieve, but we know from the scriptures that our grief, the kind of grief that Christians have, is different from the kind of grief that non-Christians have. The tragedy is still the tragedy, whatever you're thinking about, but the way that we grieve is differently. The Bible says that we as Christians, we grieve with hope, and that unbelievers grieve without hope. Now, the tragedy is still as stunning, it's still as, uh, as real, it's still as debilitating. The fact that we are Christians does not take away from the pain of our grief. But in the midst of the grief, we realize as Christian people that hope in God, we hope in God, 
And that in spite of what happens here on this planet, God is making all things new. And that one day all will be made right. This is our hope. Well, in Luke chapter 13, some people approached Jesus about tragedy. They approached him and said, what do you think about these people who experienced this tragedy? And I think that the way that Jesus responds shows us what is near the heart of Christ and how we can continue to put one foot in front of the other when we have experienced tragedy. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse one, and I'm going to ask that you stand as we read God's word together. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse Sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all of the others who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Jesus mentions two events here. He mentions what was a murder that took place when Pilate killed a bunch of Galileans. And it seems as though they were worshiping God. It seems as though they came to offer their sacrifice. And Pilate actually had been killed. Now, we know from history that Pilate, the governor of Judea, he was, he was a wicked man. He was, he was awful. He was, he was um, crazy. Uh, and it seems as though he killed these Galileans. And thus the whole, when it says that, they mingled, that, that Pilate mingled their blood. So all of the blood of these sacrifices that were being killed, and then Pilate killed these people while they were worshiping. He mentions a second event. He mentions a tower at the Tower of Siloam. The Tower of Siloam was near the pool of Siloam. You'll remember when Jesus healed the blind man in John chapter 9 and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. It was there. Well, obviously what happened, an accident took place and this tower fell and there were 18 people who were killed as a part of uh, this accident. Now, we don't know from anywhere else in Scripture, nor is there any historical uh, writing about these two events. All we know about these two events are what Jesus said says here. But when the people ask this, when they ask about this tragedy that took place, it seems as though these people were implying that those who died, the Galileans who were killed, in some way, they deserved to die this way. Uh, maybe they were implying that these people were less than, or that maybe they had some, some, some sort of sin in their life. You see, this kind of thinking was prominent in Jesus' day. People in Jesus' day, they believed, and before they believed, that disaster was rooted in personal sin. That's what they believed. They would make a correlation between a disaster that took place and some sort of sin that was involved, that was in a person's life. They walked around with this idea that if something went wrong with you, it was because you brought it on yourself. This is the kind of thinking that Job's friend 
friends had. You know, you know Job's friends, they, after Job went through the tragedy of all that he went through, Job uh, and his friends, they were doing what? His friends were doing well as long as they kept their mouth shut. As long as they didn't talk, everything was fine. But then, as soon as they opened their mouth, as soon as they started talking, here's what Eliphaz said. Now, first of all, you can be thankful that your name is not Eliphaz. But Eliphaz said to Job, this is in the middle of Job's tragedy, in the middle of all that happened. Here's what Eliphaz said to him. Is not your evil abundant? There's no end to your iniquities. And even with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? You know. For you have exacted pledges of all your brothers for nothing and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have given no water to the weary to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. The man with power possessed in the land, and the favored man lived in it. You have sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless were crushed. Therefore snares are all around you, and sudden terror overwhelms you. I don't know about you, but I don't need friends like that. Stay at home. When tragedy happens, when there is trauma that takes place around us, the thing that we don't need to do in the lives of other people and the thing we don't need to do ourselves is we do not need to try to draw some sort of correlation between the tragedy that took place and some personal sin that must be there. Because it's just not the case. Do you remember in John 9, the very man that Jesus told to go and wash in the pool of Siloam? Do you remember what the crowd said to Jesus about the blind man? You know what they said? Who sinned? Him or his parents? They thought that he was blind because of something that he or his parents did. And Jesus wouldn't even respond to these people in Luke 13. He wouldn't play their game. Jesus said, I'm not going to get roped into that kind of thinking. So he responded with another situation. He didn't even answer them. He said, you want to talk about tragedy? What about the 18 people who died with the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that these people were worse sinners because of what they experienced? And Jesus replied in both situations, no. He replied in both situations, no. Tragedy, the tragedies that we go through are not an indication of sin somewhere. It just is the fact that we live in a fallen world. There are not degrees of sin. Now, yes, there are consequences that are different, right? Different sins bring different consequences. But when it comes to tragedy particularly, there are no degrees of sin. Tragedy in a person's life is not an evidence of their status or their lack of status with God. There are not some Christians who have a better standing with God than other Christians. Something bad happening to a Christian does not mean that that person is less than or that they are not as spiritual as that they should be or they are not as loved by God as much as they could be or that they are not holy or that they have something in their life terrible going on. Sometimes tragedy just happens. And it is not a reflection of our walk with God. I want to show you a picture of Walter and Bonnie Steinkraus. This is an older picture. Walter and Bonnie Steinkraus and their two little girls were missionaries in New Guinea. They were serving with Wycliffe Bible translators. You and I have the Bible in the English Language. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., and one of the most powerful things that I saw 
um, were shelves. They had shelves that were just empty, uh, representing people who do not have access to the Word of God. Well, Stein and Krauss, Walter and Bonnie, they had picked up and moved to New Guinea. And they were living among the Tiefelman people. And they were living their lives, studying their language and translating, seeking to translate the Bible into their language. In March of 1971, the Steinkrauses were at home on a Sunday afternoon with their two girls, Carrie and Kathy. And they lived on the side of a mountain. And at three o'clock, a terrible accident took place, a tragedy took place. There was a landslide that covered about a half a mile. And the Steinkraus family were killed probably instantly. They lived in the Tiefelman village, and all of the village that day had gone to work in the fields nearby. The village was empty. Out of all of the people in the world, why them? Out of all of the people in the world, I mean, the Steinkrauses were missionaries. The Steinkrauses, they had moved to another country. They were telling people about Jesus. They were translating the scriptures. God, why would you let a mountain land fall in and kill these people? Out of all of the mountains in the world, why this mountain? Out of all of the people in the world, why these? When news got back to the United States, to the Steinkraus' family and friends, people were shocked. Rightfully so. They were stunned. They asked questions like, how could God allow this to happen? Family members of those two little girls, Carrie and Carrie, he wondered why their lives were snuffed out in such a senseless tragedy, one that's unexplained. And now, some 50 years later, we still wonder why something like this would happen. The Steinkraus family in New Guinea were not any worse sinners than any of us. You see, that type of thinking that there's a correlation between tragedy and sin, that type of thinking produces a smugness. What happened to you, but it hadn't, hadn't happened to me. You must have some kind of sin in your life. I've not experienced tragedy. The Steinkraus family, they were as just as much sinners as you and me. They were no worse than us. They were no better than us. What did the scriptures say? All have sinned. All have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. As Jesus said, hey, listen, don't talk about tragedy. If you want to talk about tragedy, here's, here's what you need to do. Take your eyes off of those who've experienced the tragedy turn them on yourself. And if you want to talk about tragedy, what you need to be talking about is repentance. Look at verse 3 of Luke 13. Luke verse 3. After they talked about Pilate killing the Galileans, Jesus said, no, I tell you, well, they were not worth sinners, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then after he mentioned the Tower of Siloam, look at verse 5, he says the very same thing. He says, no, I tell you, they weren't more sinners, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, when Jesus uses the word perish here, he's not talking about dying physically. Every single one of us is going to die physically, right? I'm closer to death today than I was yesterday. How's that for encouraging thought? 
When Jesus talks about perishing here, he's talking about eternally dying. He's talking about eternally perishing. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto man to die once, and after this comes what? Judgment. All of us are going to die once. Every single one of us. Often when something tragic happens, we think about those who've experienced it. We focus on those who've experienced it. Our focus is on their lives. Our focus is on their hearts. Our focus is on what they are going through. But what Jesus is saying here is that we as Christians, we need to turn the focus on ourselves. And we need to ask the question, if this had happened to us, would we be ready? If this tragedy happened to me, as, as bad it was, as it was, if this had happened to me, would I be ready? If I were in the Tower of Siloam when it fell, and the Tower of Siloam fell on me, or those twin towers in New York, when they fell, if they had fallen on me, would I have been ready? J.C. Ryle, that English preacher of the 19th century, says this as he's talking about tragedy. He says, the state of our own souls should always be our first concern. Not somebody else's soul. When it comes to tragedy, we need to be thinking about our soul. It is eminently true that real Christianity, he says, always begins at home. Children's Search Committee, listen to that. It is eminently true that real Christianity always begins at home. The Christian man will always think first of his own heart, his own life, his own sins. Does he fear, does he hear of sudden, sudden death? He'll say to himself, should I have been found ready if this had happened to me? Does he hear of some awful crime or deed of wickedness? He'll say to himself, are my sins? Forgiven. Have I repented of my own transgressions? Does he hear of worldly men running into whatever excess of sin? He will say to himself, who has made me to differ? What has kept me from walking the same road? May we ever seek to be people of this frame of mind. Let us take a kind interest in all around us. Let us feel tenderness and compassion for all who suffer violence or are removed by sudden death. But let us never forget to learn at home and to learn wisdom for ourselves from all that happens to others. So when we get news of things like the Champlain Tower in Florida falling, do we want to pray for all those affected? Yes, we want to pray. Do we want to do what we can do to help? Yes. But Jesus says, in addition to all those things, we need to make sure that we ourselves are ready if something like that were to happen to us. Now, you don't hear the word repent a lot these days. It's not a word that is often used in politically correct conversations. But do you realize it's a biblical word? It's, it's a Christian word to repent. Repent, it means to turn around, to, to change directions, to, to change your mind, to put your mind and your heart somewhere else. For those of us who live a thousand miles away from Florida, you know what we need to do? Repent. We need to make sure that if something like that were to happen to us, God forbid that it ever does. But we need to make sure that if something like that were to happen to us, we are ready. Our souls are ready. It's appointed unto man to die once. And after this 
comes judgment. Can I ask you this morning, are you ready? I'm not, I'm not wishing tragedy on anybody. No, 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 not at all. But I am wishing and hoping and praying that all of us are ready. That if something happens and you get that phone call, if something happens to you, you're ready. You're ready to meet God. I'm going to ask that everybody bow your head, close your eyes. And I want you just where you are to do business with God. And I, I just want you to ask one simple question. God, am I ready? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed that that condo in Florida that we go to and enjoy all week long is going to stay up. We're not guaranteed this afternoon. But one thing we are guaranteed is that it is appointed unto man to die once. And after this comes judgment. You will face the judgment of God. I will face the judgment of God. Every single one of us and for God. Are you ready? My responsibility and the responsibility of those who lead here at Chapel Hill is not to be the Holy Spirit in your life. Only you can know if you are ready. As you talk with God, has, has, has the as the work of Christ, if you received Christ, if you received what Christ has done for you, are you trusting in the things of God? I would beg of you this morning to repent. Turn from that place of trust that is not trustworthy and turn to to God. Put your hope in God. Put your trust in God. Come what may, may you be a person who says, I trust in God. Tragedy happens. Accidents happen. But our God is sure. Our God is certain. Father, we do not know what's going to occur this afternoon or tomorrow or the next day, but we do know that you are God. And that while there are things that change and there's shifting shadows all around us, you do not change. You are constant. You are right. Lord, I pray that each one of us might be ready. And that readiness is found not in our own goodness. And it's found not in our own moral superiority. That goodness is found outside of us. That goodness is found in Christ and what Christ has done for us. And so, Lord, I pray that your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, might convict us all. That we might all turn from our sins place our hope in you and that we might walk out of this place this morning ready to meet you. It says in your word that all of our days are numbered. Lord, you know exactly how long we're going to spend on this earth. You know exactly all that's going to happen to us. Lord, you have, in the midst of that, you have shown us where our hope should be. Our hope is not in the things of this world. Our hope is not in other people. Our hope is not in anything that we can say. Our hope is in you. So, Father, I pray today that each of us 
would look to you. And if there is one today who has never placed their hope and their trust in you, I pray that they might repent, turn around, change their focus, place all of their hope and all of their trust in you. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. Are you ready? Are you ready to experience whatever?